to the show with your friend and mine. So tell me, Dr. Squee, who's it gonna be this time? We like to hear you talk, but we love to hear you listen. And if you are not subscribed, you won't know what you're missing. So welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. So, my next guest, uh, she is known for Hello Hello as Mimi LeBonk. Please welcome to Squee Fest, Sue Hodge. How are Good we, morning. Sue? Good morning. How's everything with yourself? Absolutely great. It's nice to talk to you. Nice to see you again. It is indeed. We, we met uh, recently at CovCon. We did indeed. And you were hosting there and, and I commented and said how great you were. And here you are again. Yeah, as soon as someone calls me great, I have them on. It's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to start off like, taking it back to the beginning for yourself. Uh, how did you start acting? Yeah, where did it all begin for you? Well, I did the Dick Emery show when I was 14. And my first pantomime at that age was Charles Hawtrey. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and I've been carrying on ever since. Do you remember a lot about being on the Dick Emery show? Yeah, I was, um, that was, uh, we uh, filmed that at South End Airport with Uncle Dickie. And um, as I say, I was only 14. And so I've, I've, I've been going, I've been around for a while. Oh, if you were 14, not that long, surely. <laughs> well, just a couple of years. Yeah. I lead with the charm on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, I'd like to sort of talk a bit about stage work because uh, it's very, very hard to find online. You find people's acting credits on you know, TV and film, but stage is a little harder to find. So uh, can you tell us a bit about kind of uh, maybe some of the, you said about Panto, did you do a lot of stage work uh, earlier on? I did. Um, in, in actual fact, that is my, my greatest love, if I'm really honest. I mean, we all need the television, you know, or film for, you know, um, promotion but uh, it's actually live live stage work is tr treading the boards that that's my home and of course it's also very different now because I mean you used to um, always be called to London to audition or uh, for castings but of course er everything now is self tapes and zooms it's all very all very different yeah I was um, on one of the interviews yesterday it was with uh, Nicola Bryant we were talking about the fact that it kind of changed over COVID and a lot of casting directors have sort of kept it because it, it's kind of easier for them. But it's uh, it's not the same for an actor. It's not. I mean, the thing is, if you're there in front of the people, I mean, say, for example, um, I'm using this accent for um, a, a role that, you know, um, they're looking at me to cost for and and suddenly it's not quite right. Um, you, there and you, if you're in front of them, you can deal with that there and then. I mean, it, as I say, not not quite what we're you know looking for. And then suddenly you think, um, well, well, what about if I I try you know a, a, a slightly northern accent with it? And they go, yeah, try that, try that. You see, but if it's just um, a self tape and so you don't get that sort of feedback and that connection with the person you're you're dealing with. It's, it's very cold somehow um you know when as i say when you're in front of, in front of them um like the, the panel for want of a better word you've got the producer the director uh you, you know you can as i say um re feel back read back from them what what they're what they're actually looking for or after um and also i mean they get so much more of your character than just yeah. when you're yeah. just you know uh, you've got the lines that they've the script they've sent you and you're just doing what you think with it so you haven't got like the background of the character you know you can't ask any questions it's just i i personally um it's not that it's i'm not going you know progressing forward uh, with technology but i just personally uh, prefer to be in front of them doing it live 
Yeah, as you say, they get a sense of you, not just like a one recording. That's that's right. Um, and it's very seldom that they might come back and say, you know, um, to the agent, could your client do it, um, you, you know, with um, a, a Scottish accent or a whatever, a Welsh or, you, you know, it normally is. They just got what they've you've sent them and, and, and that's it. So you've got no feedback on how it went or, you, you know, what they were looking for. Um, so I, I just prefer, as I say, jump on the train and go down and meet them. And we were talking about the stage work. Uh, there are some uh, favourite productions from over the years. Oh, well, I mean, um, I also have a musical background. Um, I I can dance. I mean, I don't I don't use it very often, but I can dance. Um, I mean, in, in sort of my time, um, you know, you were sort of looking at working 52 weeks in the year and it was more beneficial if you could sing, if you could dance, if you could act, you know. So um, I did everything. And one of my favorite, well, I've got two favorite musicals. One is Rocky Horror Show, which I absolutely loved. Great load of fun doing that. And the other is Jesus Christ Superstar. Now, not because I played a wonderful role in that, but because you actually, it's like a huge technical exercise. You actually have to cover four octaves. That's the range of the musical. So one minute you're, you know, sort of well, right down in your boots. And then the next minute you're Hosanna Super starring with, you know, hitting a top A. So that was, a, I loved it as a wonderful exercise. I remember, because that was for um, Robert Stigwood organization and i remember um him actually saying after so you should go for any musical now he said because your vocal range will never ever be better than it is at this precise moment uh well, well um my particular band leader who does the theme tune for this show uh for my uh, radio show uh matt lee's uh, an a a four octave range done that's impressive yeah, so I don't suppose I could do it now, but hey, I mean, if anybody's out there wanting me to have a go, I'm, I'm willing. I'm up for it. And and Matt very uh, modestly says, I struggle enough with one octave sometimes. No, you, you do wonderfully, Matt. Go, don't do yourself down, sir. But yeah, four <laughs> octaves, that is, that's very impressive. Did he, did, did he say octaves or op optics? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say he was pretty on the optics, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and you, you mentioned Rocky Horror. Who, who did you play in that? I played um, Columbia, uh, yeah. and I just absolutely loved her. Um, so uh, it, just a, such a fun musical. And I do remember, I mean, quite often when you do something like that, you've got more um, dressing up in the audience than you've got on stage. And I remember... Um, somebody who came dressed as Eddie, who uh, Columbia, uh, you know, um, had a big crush on Eddie, actually broke <laughs> into my dressing room through the back toilet window and said, come on my bike south side. <laughs> <laughs> was off on his motorbike. <laughs> and I understand you've lived happily ever since. <laughs> Indeed, whizzing around on a moped. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, uh, have you ever um, uh, met Patricia Quinn on your travel through the cons? I have. Yes, She's amazing, I isn't have. she? Isn't she just? Yes. Um, on some of the memorabilia shows, you know, um, I've, I've, I've seen her. Um, but whilst we're staying with stage, I mean... Um, OK, that's the musical side. But when I was... 18, uh, Bill Kenwright cast me opposite Sylvia Sims in The Innocents. And that was, I mean, I was supposed to be a very young child, but I mean, when I was 18, I still looked about 12. Uh, so that was one of my first introductions to, you know, straight drama. And I absolutely loved that as well. And Sylvia was w wonderful. She was a great tutor, a great help. And I stayed at her house quite often and met, you know, some fabulous people. Um, 
I cooked, I helped her cook, shall I say, uh, part of dinner for uh, Lewis Gilbert one night. So I met all sorts of people, you know, through her and her background. She, she was wonderful, wonderful person. And her daughter, uh, Beatty, Edney, was actually my understudy. So, um, so just some lo lovely sort of, you know, uh, trips down memory lane there. Yeah, and I think that if you do, you know, it's, it's not a given, but when you do get that relationship, when you get to hang out, you get to cook together, you get to sort of bond as a crew, it does translate onto the stage. It does. I mean, I've um, written a book, um, Hello, it's Mimi's Memoirs, Hello, Hello. And um, first of all, it was self-published. But um, then last year, um, Austin McCauley uh, said um, they would publish it. So they, they, uh, that went um, republished the end of June this year. And if it does well, they've asked me to, um, if they could have first refusal on second book. And I'd love to get the chance to do that because some of these tales that I'm telling you with Sylvia, et cetera, et cetera, I'm actually going to put in, in the second book. And there's an hilarious story about the Lewis Gilbert evening when um, Sylvia made a curry. And because I'd never made a curry uh, in those days when I was 18. And so I was asked to deal with the rice. And she gave me a two pound bag of, of, of rice and said, you know, you, you do that. So she said, the water, when the water boils, you put the rice in. Well, I just tipped the whole lot in. <laughs> Because that's what she said. And suddenly this thing was growing and growing and building up the top of this pan. And I'm shouting out, hello, hello, <laughs> anybody there to help me? And of course she came in and went, oh my God, what have you done? <coughs> and um, she said, how much did you put in there? And then <laughs> I held up this empty bag and she went, oh, Gordon Bennett, someone was bashing it with a wooden spoon, trying to push it back down. And when <laughs> Louise Gilbert came that evening and she served and she introduced me and said, this is Sue, she said, who made the rice. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first introduction to Louise Gilbert. Oh, that's lovely. And the the first book, is, is it just, uh, obviously the title is, is about a low load, but was that just covering your time on a low load? Does it? Uh, I tell any... you what it is. I tell you what it is. I wanted to do it differently. I thought I just, I don't want to start um, as just, you know, the um, autobiography of Sue Hodge, blah, blah, blah. So what it actually is, it's the truth behind the making of Alone, what actually happened, but it's written through the eyes of Mimi, i.e. only Mimi really knew what happened, what did Rene say to her when she was in the pram, what uh, did uh, actually happen um, as a flying nun. So it's all the truth but told through her eyes. It's not told through me. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love books like that, which kind of take it on a different path and you get to see it from a different angle. Yeah, I mean, it starts, it starts, you know, with saying Mimi was so excited as she, you know, travelled uh, from France to London to meet her new family. Oh, brilliant. And, and I kind of like the idea that uh, everyone's a hero in their own book. So it just um, depends yeah, on who's yeah. writing it. Yeah. So and um, it contains um, all the rest of, uh, you know, recipes, um, but they're all using all the characters names. <laughs> Great. So what was the Rene dish? Re Rene's Rissoles, of course. Of course it was, of course. Rene's Rissoles, Crab Trees Crab Cakes, um, Gruber's Little Gingerbread Men, uh, Fanny's flapjack, Helga's cheesy cheese, whatever it is, um, cheesy rare bit, Helga's cheesy rare bit, and um, Yvette's bun in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, childish as I am, uh, Fanny's flapjack uh, is the winner there for me. Uh, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Moving on, um, one of your first credits on IMDb, you, you worked on Brazil, which has just got an amazing cast, so it's uh, with Jonathan Price and Robert De Niro leading an all-star cast, 
Uh, and you, you perform. You were one of the performers of the forces of darkness. What what's that I was entail? A force, I was a force of darkness. And uh, talking about, I mean, you couldn't have done this on Zoom or a self tape. Um, you had to be able to walk, sort of. Um, on your haunches uh, and be able to glide across the floor without bobbing up and down. I mean, can you imagine trying to hold your <laughs> your mobile phone whilst you're doing this? <laughs> so this was one of the necessities uh, which got you cast for that role. And did you know, did you know, I'm sure you did, but little did I know that um, three doors down in another studio in Brazil, was Gordon Kay? Oh well, yeah. I, no, I've forgotten. When you say it, I yeah, I remember now you say it. I mean, little did I know then uh, what my life was going to become with, with him. <laughs> did, did you? But you, you didn't meet him at that stage. No, no. no. Oh, how mad! I, I know. Isn't that that was barking mad stuff, isn't it? Uh, so you you joined the Low uh, at some series in. Uh, did were you aware of the show? Had you watched it yourself? Prior? No, I'd okay. never seen it before. Um, because I remember when my agent said, um, I, I was I was doing a play called Strippers down in Colchester at the Mercury Theatre with uh, Michael Winter, who we christened Lady De Winter as we would because we were all naughty, and um, I it was the last night and we were all going to do you know the last night party as you do and i got a call from my agent that said um i've just sent you off on the back of a courier um with all your details to david croft's house so i said yeah she said so you're gonna have to go there tomorrow morning she says so get yourself back to london pronto and i said I'm going to the last night party and she went you are not young lady you get yourself back here pretty pronto so anyway back I came and went to David's house the next day not knowing really why I was going or what it was about and so and he he told me Jeremy Lloyd was there uh, the uh, co-writer for Alo Alo and so and, and of course I didn't know what they were talking about and I remember saying to David Croft well, no, of course I haven't seen it. I work for a living. <laughs> but I, I take it you were aware of David Croft's work. I knew of David Croft's work, of <laughs> course, but I didn't know why I was there. They, and they, he said, well, we saw you at the Open Air Theatre last year. So I said, oh, yes. Um, and he said, with Bernard Breslau. And we decided we would write you into this alone. No, so I just, I just said, oh, lovely. Oh, that, that's, that's really nice. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of quite a break from what they'd had previously in the uh, waitresses. Uh, well, it would, it would be with me, wouldn't it? Oh, I just love the fact that you were kind of like, it was actually, if, if you think about it, it's quite ahead of its time. You were the sexual aggressor. Like that, that uh, you know, it's <laughs> very modern, really. <laughs> How could you call me a sexual aggressor when I came in looking like Frank Spencer? Well, it's it, the way you were going after Renee. That's how I say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean all the all the characters. You know, the girls threw themselves at Renee, but maybe literally she took it literally, didn't she? Yes, it was. It's more attack stance. <laughs> yes, but throw you. Can you throw yourself at Renee? Yeah. Whoa. I mean. Uh, what was it like when you saw, like, when you looked at the scripts and you saw what you were going to do? Like, were you just like, yeah, I'm just going to go for this? Well, I mean, it was very, it was different because in the rehearsal room um, at Acton, I mean, there was no bed. You know, it was just sort of like a bench. So it wasn't until I got to, um, actually, we transferred to the studio, which we always did on a Friday, that I saw the room and I thought, Oh, that's the, uh, that's, yeah, I wonder, I wonder. I thought, I wonder if I can get from the door and land on him. So, and I'd not tried it. <laughs> when he said, you know, she you, she knocks at the door, doesn't she? You know, Rene, you know, and he said, go away, my, uh, my wife, blah, blah, blah. And she says, uh, she is in the kitchen. He says, there's a key under the door. So you hear the little unlock and she just literally, I just thought, right, go on, go, Hodge, go. <laughs> And I landed on him. I can remember him going, <laughs> <laughs> Poor 
That's all the air coming, you know, gushing out of his stomach. <laughs> I still oh, was great for, for Renee to be challenged in that way. <laughs> it's just this, this, yes, this thought, ridiculous flirt with everyone. Buy a four foot eleven pocket dynamo. Yes, it was brilliant. That's what was perfect <laughs> about it. Um, yeah, it was, it was just nice to see him a little bit wrong footed with everything. It, it, yes, yes. Um, uh, Sarah Cope just saying that she loved a low, low, uh, so say we all, of course. Uh, Sarah, if you've got any questions, please let us know. This is your opportunity to put them to, to Sarah Hodge and uh, sorry, um, Sarah Hodge, sorry, Sue Hodge. Sarah and Sue Hodge, the sisters. It, it, it's, I, I will just say, uh, hour 22 is it right now? <laughs> I'm just trying to... <laughs> I think I'm on hour 23. Yeah, 23. Yeah, two, no, 22. No, it's 22. <laughs> so at this point in proceeding, things get a little surreal for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, and I take it that just kind of like influenced, like you, you decided to just go for it in this first uh, performance and that just carried forth into the into the rest of the scripts, I take it. Yeah, I mean, I was always doing things like that. Um... It was like um, when, when she hadn't kissed him yet. And he said, you know, well, it's very difficult, me up here, you down there. And I thought um, in order to, to, <laughs> to do what I wanted, which was to jump, uh, like get my legs round him and, and hang on to him. So I thought, oh, these wretched skirts, you know, these tight fitted skirts. So I remember just uh, before that, just ripping the thing I thought that that needs to be ripped up the side then I'll be able to get round round him so I just ripped it <laughs> without, uh, without without a thought of course that I've got to continue then the rest of the ep with uh, a skirt like that <laughs> 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 you think about those things after do you remember uh Gordon Kay's reaction after that well yes because he just thought it was uh, brilliant. And so um, Edith ca comes in and says, you know, Rene, what are you doing with that servant girl crawling all over you? And he just then threw me over his shoulder and, and I just hung there down, down his back and he played the rest of the scene like that. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and um, obviously Gordon sadly no longer with us. Uh, can you tell us a bit about working with Gordon Kay and what it was like on the set? Well, for me, I mean, I know a lot of people found uh, Gordon, you know, um, he could be difficult to be with. But you see, I never had a problem with that because for Gordon, it was either right or it was wrong. And um, we, he used to suggest something to, to me and, he, and I'd think, well, try it. Don't go against it because it might be a better idea than, than what you were going to do. So I always loved Gordon's input and we got on terribly, terribly well. Um, when we did the stage show, Hello, Hello, um, in New Zealand, um, yeah. we, were, we were gonna be flying back and Gordon said to me, had I ever been to Australia, which I hadn't at that time. So he said, oh, I love Sydney. And he said, do you want to come? So I said, what, just come to Australia with you? He said, yeah, my treat. And so, we flew home far Sydney, stayed at King's Cross and spent a, a few days with Gordon there. He, he became a very, very close friend. Um, and I, I, it was really sad for me towards the end, you know, when I knew I knew he was going and we had done a raw command together as well. And he, he'd always told me that um, he he didn't think he would get past 70. I mean, he did get past 70, but I mean, with the accident that happened, I suppose it was inevitable that he would be taken, I think, before his time. Yeah, um, but some wonderful remembrances of him there. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned the stage show there. So what was that? That was during the run of Alola. It was still going at the time? It, it was. I mean, yeah. do you know, my, my whole life, when I joined it in 19... 1987 my whole life then for the next six years just became a low low we only stopped um for the stage show when the series finished and uh, and then we went as i say to the stage show somewhere then we only stopped the stage show because it was time for another series and so that whole period of my life i did nothing else but 
hello hello so you can tell i mean we all became such a family um, yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't class it as a soap but it it's probably a little i've not done a soap but it's probably a little bit like uh, doing a soap where you just live in each other's pockets day in day out you know yeah um and with the stage show so uh, how many countries did you end up doing with that and how, how do you get something which has got like i, I think it's integral to a lower low to have these insane props these insane setups how does that translate to the stage well uh, D david and jeremy just wrote a, a brilliant um stage show um and so all the characters literally basically uh, transfer from television to stage and it's like um as opposed to doing one episode it's like doing six continuous episodes where you sort of there's a storyline a through storyline and i actually ended up all in all um at the london palladium was where i think we what well, i don't even when we finally landed but one of the latter um times we played it and so i've ended up in the hall of fame there um with the course which is lovely and i think i did about 2500 performances of it wow that's amazing and and w which countries did you tour with it well we um we went to new zealand first and australia was very upset that they didn't get the first pick so um we actually all in all i think by the time we toured the the whole of you know australia we were actually out there for about six months um and as you can imagine it doesn't translate i mean like in bulgaria it's huge in bulgaria uh hello hello they've actually been showing it for now it must be about 25 consecutive years and every year they perform it at the local theater but um, we could not do it um, because um, none of us <laughs> can speak Cyrillic. Um, so, so, but we did go to Bulgaria as guests and it was very funny to be sitting watching Hello Hello, uh, the stage show. We knew the lines so well and suddenly um, there, there we were watching all these other people perform it. And as I say, it's Cyrillic. It was quite bizarre. The, the surreal sort of relic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's something I did want to touch upon. I, I love the fact that Hello Hello has been translated in so many languages. I remember being in France and it seemed so surreal to see Hello Hello on TV in French, whereas so many of the jokes are around uh, mispronunciations of name. You know, this character, the, the yeah. airmen, they, they rely on that kind of mispronunciation. Uh, it just seemed to kind of sort of like, um, uh, it, it, insane that it kind of like that that it was so big there uh, and you were saying it was it was big in Germany as well well could you believe that I remember David Croft actually saying hey kids game set and match the Germans have bought it so I think I mean <coughs> excuse me um I think with the Germans it was the younger generation that first um sort of you know <laughs> clocked on with this and because people were saying surely though you know that couldn't have gone well there and i think once the younger generation who were maybe not you know so, so um affected by the war and what really mm. happened uh, and once they got it you know in, into their system i think then they um you know said, said to the maybe the parents uh their older generation you know you should watch it because it's actually very tongue-in-cheek it doesn't actually take the michael out of anybody it just takes the michael out of everybody i mean kinky germans randy french and the the english you know came out as stupid twits yes <laughs> and, you know. I, think also, I think also uh in germany they've got a very healthy attitude of of teaching the war they make sure that it's uh you know they they, they do talk about what happened and, and yeah, the yeah. In it. And I think that makes it more apt to be able to have a spoof on it because, you know, yes. if you talk about it in the real terms, then having a comedy isn't going to hurt you. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, let's face it. I mean, I just said, you know, the and the, and the British, you know, the English come out of stupid twits. But one thing we are very, very good at in this country is actually sending ourselves up. We laugh at ourselves and we like to laugh. Completely, completely. Uh, I want to talk about some of the other uh, legends who were in Hello Hello, which are sadly no longer with us. So uh, Carmen Silvera as Edith. Uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one has to say the day that um, David Croft suggested that she sang was a touch of, you know, sheer brilliance. And um, so there, as she did it, as she, um, as you know of her singing. And so David Croft said, I wonder, Carmen, if it might be funnier if you started the number sort of relatively in tune. And she just interjected and said, I did. <laughs> and she, as far as she was concerned, <laughs> that that was it. She was she was singing that properly. So she unbeknownst to her, she was a method bad singer. <laughs> she she could not sing for Toffee. <laughs> unlike, that Rose, makes more unlike Rose Hill, who played Madame Fanny upstairs, and Rose came from an operatic background. Yeah, I remember you saying that on. Uh, well, one of you said it on the stage uh, when we were at CoughCon. I just I can't believe that. Uh, um, yeah, amazing kind of history behind her. Yeah. Uh, also, come Silvera, it just seemed like you needed someone who um, could sort of, like you say, like could be sent up in one scene, but could really be a foil to Renee. Renee wasn't going to get away with everything with her about. And also, I mean, one must not forget, I don't know if any, um, any of you saw it, but she did a beautiful scene in Dad's Army where she played a... Um, a sort of sweetheart of um, Captain Mannering, and it was a beautiful. Carmen was a beautiful actress, a, a very good straight actress. Wow, that's amazing! Um, oh, Kenneth Connor, of course, the Carry On legend, um, Monsieur Alphonse. He was such a naughty boy. He ca he came into work one day, and he was screaming with laughter. And he said, oh, I've had such a fun morning. Um, he said, we've just been delivered um, a new bin by the dustman. She said, um, it, wheelie bins have been introduced. So he said, oh, right. And so um, the next um, time that they came to empty the bin, he thought, because the, the wheelie bins sort of got, had the top like that, didn't they? And yeah. so he got inside it. <laughs> And when the chap came to wheel it away, he just opened it slightly and said, go away, leave me alone. <laughs> and this guy sort of went, ah! and, and, and ran off. <laughs> and left the bin. I mean, that was Kenneth Connor, his humour. He was, he was such fun to have around. Yeah, I mean, it, it really felt like, you know, the funny thing was, because I think he, uh, I put it down to him playing it so well. As a kid, I would see the Carry On films, I'd see Hello and Low, and I would never associate the two as the same person. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely not. I mean, um, he 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 brought something unique to Hello, didn't he? But there again, you see, he was so used to comedy, you know, with his Carry On background, et cetera, et cetera. He knew exactly how to uh, pull a line out, wait for the laugh, you know, so um as i say he brought something very special to it funny enough when i look back at it in hindsight i could almost picture some of his characters from carry on uh growing into that kind of aged lothario <laughs> yes indeed indeed uh we've got um sam kelly i i loved him in so many things i remember him from on the up uh, very fondly yes. uh, as captain hans gearing yeah now you said on the on the up um mm. Which I know we're talking about Sam, uh, who another one taken, you know, uh, before his time. But yeah. on the up starred Judy Buxton. And next, is it next? No, the end of this month, the end of this month, I shall be joining Jude and Jeff Holland with, um, we call it Bob, the best of British comedy, which is going um, to Litchfield and one other place we're going to uh, uh felix Stowe, that's right so keep your eyes out for, for that um we brought it out earlier in the year and we are going to continue it next year i think but uh so i, sh I shall be seeing a little bit of on the up with uh jude, jude buxton amazing uh, and i do just want to also shout out just because we're talking about sam kelly and i did really enjoy him 
not only was he an amazing uh, comedic uh, performer, but uh, I remember him very specifically from um, GBH, with alongside Michael Palin and yep. uh, um, uh, Robert Lindsay. And it was just, uh, it sort of really showed that, uh, I, I wish he'd got to do a few more kind of straight roles like that because he, he had that in his pocket too. He was an amazing actor. Well, I mean, really, comedy and tragedy, they, they do run, a, you know, a parallel, really. Um, they're, they're very, very, very close. Um, and I, I think in order uh, to be able to do good comedy, you actually need to be a very serious person because comedy is a very serious business. Completely. And it, I don't know, there was, there was just something that's just uh, very comforting about his presence. He was always kind of, like, he seemed to be always playing the friend and the kind of, even, even in Lower Low, it was kind of the lovable fool. Uh, yes, he, and which was Sam, lovable. One of the most affable guys you could ever come across. Uh, well, we've talked a bit about it, but uh, you are just such an extremely bonded cast still to this day. Uh, what was the environment like on the set, just bouncing off each other? Um, well, I mean, it'd be like any family. It didn't mean that, you know, you didn't have crosswords sometimes because, you know, when you're living that closely to, together all the all the time, you, you do. And I think that was the greatest thing that, you know, um, that we we were straight, we were truthful. If something wasn't working, or if somebody you know was having an off day, or somebody said, you know, I'm really tired. I'm so you know so sorry. Not normally like it, it was acceptable because it's it's as you would accept, um, you know, as a member of your family. It doesn't always go tickety boo, you know. So I I think it was incredible that we all got on the way way we did and I think you can only get on really like that if you you know um you're not pulling any punches and and you're honest and you're straight with each other well it was rather lovely I I know I told you this at CovCon just to share it with everyone uh, I did love when I was set in uh, there's a pub across the road from where we were all staying and I just sat down to to uh, have something to eat and you guys all came in and and sat next to each other and obviously I didn't want to disturb your kind of like your dinner and everything I knew I'd have time to talk to you the next day uh and it was just the wonderful atmosphere of just uh, just taking the mickey out of each other, like uh, talking yep. about who's seeing who these days, like uh, the kind of single members of the crew. And it just it, it was just such a warmth and friendship there. Well, that that's absolutely true. And, you know, we can not see each other for months on end and then we'll meet up on, on you know, some uh, whatever function it is. And it's just like where, where we last left off. And the, we're still the noise we are you well you know how noisy <laughs> we are we are just um people that go 150 miles an hour permanently i did love um and i i'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing this but um it was a uh, guy oh sorry there was guy, Pierre? guy guy sorry. Uh, yeah yeah sorry of course uh, he was sat there and he was talking to you about the fact there was a charity event the next day and obviously joking before anyone says anything, but I did love that. He said, yeah, it's, it's a charity thing tomorrow. Let's just get really drunk. <laughs> just, 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 I had to Let's actually start a laugh from the next table. I, <laughs> I like, it's, but I'm sorry, that's it's hysterical. But you yeah. see, it's... It's a bit like, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been, um, spent a couple of hours with Sue Pollard. Have you done that? I have not. Right. Well, you've missed out because <laughs> that <laughs> is somebody. I mean, we think we go at 150 miles an hour. If you get the chance to spend a couple of hours with Sue, um, take the opportunity because that is unbelievable. And Sue can go. 24 hours round the clock and still be on a matinee giving it as i say 150 so um you thought we 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 were loud and and terribly badly behaved get sue pollard you ain't seen nothing yet oh yeah i mean it was it was um genuinely it was one of the highlights when i was just sat with you when we were waiting for the text to arrive and we were just watching the world go by and just commenting <laughs> on everyone then <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> I know, and we're all standing in these ridiculous outfits and yes. uniforms and things, you know, as, as if this is quite normal. I mean, hair flick looking like he was wearing his wallet, as you, you know, always did. And, and people just sort of going by and looking and thinking, that's them from a low, a low. <laughs> Why are they all standing in a car park? Yeah, and they're all in their uniforms. Do they really just want to be that spotted that much? <laughs> they, yes, are, are they living those characters, you know, uh, still after all this time? This is all they do. <laughs> I mean, this is what um, I was saying to someone yesterday. Funny enough, we were um, talking about a film on one of the other shows on the, the lineup for this. And we were talking about the scene where it's kind of set at a, 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 at a convention. I don't know. Do you know the film Galaxy Quest? Yes, I love it. <laughs> lovely isn't it and they do this bit where they all come on stage all in their outfits and someone said it's like oh they don't really wear their outfits in real life i go oh au contraire they the cast of a low low certainly do <laughs> they do yes i mean um I've, I've you can't see me now but i've i've still got my apron on yes <laughs> <laughs> it's also the fact obviously some of the german outfits uh insignia did have to go but apart from that it's all there um, I mean, for, for you, I, I know this is a bit of a hack question, but but for you, are, are there a favourite episode or episodes? Um, well, out of so many, um, sixty three that I did, uh, I oh gosh, one that I'll always remember because I think it took me back to my Rocky Horror um, Show days was when it was decided I would be a bald-headed butler with one tooth, and uh, as, as you are. Um, and I had a wonderful makeup guy, Neil, who created this image, and I just loved it because um, to actually see yourself, you know, bald, and this, he, he was brilliant, Neil, uh, and he created this character, and having all, all the teeth blacked out, except except the one so that is um a memory that i i love purely for the you know for that that reason uh but there's just so many amazing apps um i don't know that i could actually single any any, any of the you know anything out uh but i do remember that w with the fun of being turned into this this character and uh, I mean, that speaks to something which I did love about it, like not only the, the incredible outfits, but the props, like there were so many insane props and uh, setups to the show. Uh, is there any kind of prop or kind of like, uh, w which ones were your favourite to work with? Because well, it was just I mean, so great you, you're, say, you're saying about the props, I mean, we christened them the VisiFX boys, the, the ones that, you know, the guys that did the visual uh, effects. We all mm. used to love those days. Because, um, you know, um, <laughs> I can remember being out to dinner uh, the night before and I said, right, well, I'm going to have to shoot, guys, because we're blowing up a piss while tomorrow. Um, you know, and you'd be dri driving a tank and I, I couldn't drive it because my feet wouldn't touch the pedals. So, <laughs> Madam Edith, <laughs> so Madam Edith jumped in to take over and we crashed into the pissoir, uh, which Crabtree was using at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so Brings home you mean to was pissing by the window. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> the, as I say, the, the visual effects on it were, were, were terrific. I used to love those days. Um, I had to uh, spot the Germans coming across uh, you, you know the the courtyard and um, the cafe um, was going to get <laughs> blown up and I remember when they actually like a rim shot bang the glass went I mean it was it, it, incredible the boys were brilliant but yeah. I, I I actually um, was the cause of something going very very wrong when we were all on the train to Geneva uh, well not all half the cast were on it and um, Mimi was going to go because she knew Rene was uh, going to be on this train. And um, <laughs> I remember the director saying, now, do not forget that you're on a train. So don't just walk. You know, you need to be on. Da -da 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 -da. You need to be on a train. And so this train was built on piles of tires, 
a big, thick, enormous like tractor rubber tires um, so that it would actually rock the carriage. But nobody, <laughs> nobody told me that there were going to be any crew members um, at the end of the carriage which were going to help it. So as I got on and started to do my lines, they were going backwards and they were going dig a dun dig a dun And I went to speak and I just went ah! <laughs> and just collapsed in a folded in half because they just look so stupid. <laughs> And I just cried with laughter. And of course, then they realised that all the mascara was running down my face. So they had to hold it up. I was sent straight back into makeup to put my face back together. That's beautiful. Uh, oh. And uh, yeah, uh, we've, we've said about you travelling the world, uh, doing these conventions still to this day. Uh, what have some of the kind of uh, fan reactions been? And are there any kind of like fan interactions you remember particularly from the cons? Uh, well, there's just so, so many fans. Um, but one gorgeous, gorgeous time was, um, and he could have been all of seven, I suppose. And his mother has brought him along as Ren, <laughs> as Rene. And he was carrying a rose to give to me. And that was just, I know I've got the photograph of it. And that was absolutely beautiful. I mean, I, I can't believe the fans. They are incredible. I mean, they, they you know, they come dressed up and, and, they, and they, they're so interested in it. Um, I mean, they just, well, you've seen it. You know, they just, they want to spend hours with you. Um, so I to say you can't get rid of them, but you can't, you know, and there's a lot of people um, at these functions on that day and they're, they all just want to share just a little piece of you and um, you, you, it's all very real for them and they, they want to have photographs with you. I mean, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's lovely that it's still out there today you know it's on drama it's on yesterday uh and it's still actually very very big you know still worldwide and it's it's one which i think has aged very well like there, there's stuff which is in there which you wouldn't do today and that's fine but it's like it, there's other sitcoms of its same time which weren't as pleasant i, I, I don't know how to put it it's just well, making you it mean, age worse you, no what you mean is they don't quite stand up um, like this still does they look dated yeah. or somehow seem dated but Alo has just stood the you know the series of time um may maybe because it is you know uh, an historic i.e the war perhaps you know that's part of it because the other one that still goes like that is dad's army yeah and i i think that but with both of those examples they're very kind uh silly humor uh there's no yeah, kind yeah. of trace of meanness to them i feel like the ones which have even got the hint of meanness to them, then if you've got something which is out of step with the day, it looks even worse for it. Yeah, yeah, in, indeed. I mean, 40 Towers. I mean, if, if ever that's rerunning, people, it still gets the viewing figures because people absolutely love it. I mean, it was a brilliant, brilliant programme, 40 Towers. Oh, yeah. I mean, I often have this kind of uh, thing which really annoys me, the fact that the German episode is seen as not PC. He's the idiot. Oh. That's the whole point in it. He is the idiot. They are the sensible ones. Uh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, the other thing is, of course, as well, if you don't like that kind of thing, well, don't put it on, then don't watch it. You know, <laughs> but the, you know, there's an off button. Press it. Um, yeah. I, I, I love that. But what a moron it makes him look and how high status it makes them look. It's not. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I'll get off my soapbox now. Get off your soapbox, <laughs> dying. Yeah. In 2007, uh, you got to uh, return in the return of Alo Alo. Uh, that seemed, and it was, if I'm, I'm remembering correctly, that you were playing your, as your characters in that. We, we were, but the odd thing was, um, in 2007, um, Mimi married Monsieur Leclerc. <laughs> I didn't remember that. I know, I know. Um, and because um, he... <laughs> He was a safe breaker, wasn't he? <laughs> he was, he was. He was. <laughs> so um, she, she arrived sort of dripping in diamonds, you know. <laughs> Lovely. Um, uh, before we let you go, uh, what's, what's coming up next for you? What are you up to at the moment? 
Well, I'm desperately, desperately hoping I'm going to get the chance to write a second book. Um, I'm patron of um, a, a theatre dance school. So I actually do um, summer school. Um, I write a direct pantomime. So I'm actually at the moment uh, in casting, we, you know, for the pantomime. Uh, we'll be at Haverhill this year, at the Arts in Haverhill with Cinderella. And so, as I say, I write that. My husband is the musical director, so um, he's arranging um, that show, arranging uh, a new show for Easter. Um, we we are um, part of a creative team with Chris Gidney for That's Entertainment Productions. So we um, we do a lot of what I call behind the scenes now with the, the creative side of things. Two cruises next year. Uh, comedy theme based. Um, <clears throat> we do. Um, we we raise a lot of money uh, for for churches um, because I put together uh, a concert version of Godspell. So we do that uh, on on a ship uh, next next year. So we we still got our hands in the pies. I was going to say, Sue. Look, if you haven't got much on, just say it. <laughs> <laughs> There is no stopping you, I swear, uh, and and no. nor would I want to. No, who wants to stop? You're a long time pushing up daisies. That's so true. Uh, just because you said about the uh, second book, that relies on uh, loads of sales of the first book. You said it's in reprint. Where can everyone get it? They can get it uh, most bookshops, Amazon, Waterstones. Um, it, it's it's gone it's gone out everywhere now. So it's Mimi's memoirs, a low, a low. So if you want to help Mimi get the second book, go out and get it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sue. It's an absolute pleasure. It was a pleasure talking to you at CovCon. And uh, just thank you for being you. And thank you for being you too. And I hope to see you again soon. You too, Sue. Take care. Bye. God, darling, God bless.